BBC Radio 5 Live. Your call now. Should Britain pull out of the European Court of Human Rights? Carry on Qatar, Europe's court jesters. Many headlines this morning focus on uh, Abu Qatar. Do we need this court? We're a civilised country, good human rights record. Uh, would we be any worse off without it? There are those who say we should part way with it. It's just holding us back coming up with some outrageous decisions uh, but it's good to be at the forefront of this in the world to show a good example to the rest of the world um, is, is one of our finest achievements protecting the millions of people uh, the human beings who these rights are for safeguarding their rights our rights is having to keep people like Abu Qatar a price worth paying for the greater good. Justice Secretary Ken Clark says you can't judge its success on a few high-profile failures. A minister like myself can't keep up a running commentary on every decision of every court reacting to newspaper descriptions of the facts or the reaction of aggrieved relatives or victims or whoever. Yeah. This dotting about from case to case where it happens to have annoyed or upset somebody is no way of judging legal process. Is he right? Should we look at the big picture and be thankful for it? Uh, should we pull out of the European Court of Human Rights? That's the question. 0500 909 693, that's the number, and here's the text, 85058. Good morning. Right, the European Court of Human Rights is a big uh, conference about it in Brighton, seeing if it can uh, be uh, sorted out in the sense that there is such a backlog of cases. Can they get them through the system quicker? So people who very much support the European Court of Human Rights worry that that will sideline justice for some people. It's six minutes past nine o'clock. Spoke earlier on to Ken Clark, the uh, Secretary of State for Justice on this. Mentioned Paul, Paul Houston. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Nicky. Good to talk to you. Now, you. I mentioned to him that I had spoken to you about this. Just to tell people, just joining us, uh, yours is one of the cases that people always cite as a, a, an egregious example of it not working and a, a, a perverse decision. Amy, right, your daughter, 12 years old, knocked down and killed by a, a failed Iraqi asylum seeker, uh, Mr. Ibrahim. The courts tried to deport him. He was allowed to stay after arguing it would breach his human rights. Um, specifically, this was Article 8, wasn't it? That's right, yes. Would you t t tell, us, tell us about your campaign. Uh, well, my campaign is about um, making the Human Rights Act sort of balanced and, and fair for the individual. Uh, my argument's always been um, the court doesn't take into consideration my human rights over Mr. Ibrahim's, and, and at no point was my viewpoint took, took into consideration in the, in the tribunal. What did the judge say to you at the tribunal? Uh, well, the, the, the UK Border Agency actually, uh, the, the barrister for, for, the, for the UK Border Agency actually said, when I asked him if I, uh, what about my rights, he said, well, quite frankly, Mr. Houston, you haven't got any. Um, however, you know, when, when, it went to the, when it went to the High Court, uh, the Royal Court of Justice, um, the High Court judge there did say, even though he wasn't actually ruling on the original decision, he said, had this case come before him, he possibly would have took a different viewpoint, mm. which, is, which makes me sort of feel that I was sort of right in what I was saying, but the decision had already been made, so they didn't really want to be seen to be looking stupid and overruling another judge. And how do you feel about the fact Mr Ibrahim has been allowed to, to stay here after everything that has happened? And he drove away from the scene and he didn't have insurance, he didn't have a licence, did he? Um, uh, how do you feel about the fact that he was granted leave to stay here because of his right to a family life, given that you lost Amy? Well, it was very galling, and, and, you know, I mean, I'm not an, an unreasonable man. You know, had he just come into the country and he wasn't aware of the driving regulations, and he got in a car and drove it, and it had been an accident, and he was genuinely remorseful for what he'd done, if he'd stayed with the car with Amy, then it could have made all the difference. Um... He, went, but, he, le he left the scene, yeah. But he left. He ran off and, and left her trapped under the wheels of the car, and 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 she died. Uh, she died um, four hours later. I had to. Sw I had the difficult decision, well, the awful decision of any parent would have to go through, which is is having to switch a life support machine off. But <coughs> excuse me. But it was the fact that he got in a car and drove it a year later, and and he had a string of other convictions for possession of drugs and damage to property and harassment. Um, uh, burglary, and and he'd also been the, the, the family man that he claimed to be. He was also arrested uh, for a domestic incident and, and and bound over to keep the peace. You know, so mm. um, you know it, it's very galling when 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 somebody claims to be a family man, and in reality, you know, the, the fact is, is quite different. And it's it's the way that the tribunals are set up, where they accept hearsay evidence. 
Um, well, we'll, we'll get on to that. Can I play okay. you this interview? Did, you, you possibly didn't hear it because I mentioned your case because I met you the other day at, okay. the, at the Big Questions yes. and it was, was a great meeting you. Thank you. Uh, and, um, and talking to you at length about this on the air and off the air. And I, I, so because of that, fresh in my mind, I mentioned this as an example to Ken Clark. I had an exchange with the Justice Secretary earlier on. You can probably hear it now for the first time. Here's, okay, here's some of you. what happened here. 12-year-old Amy Houston, she was, she was, she was run over by an Iraqi asylum, a failed asylum seeker who was in Britain. He fled the scene, she died in hospital. And this is key, and you will be able to comment on this. You're, you're he was sentenced... No, you will be able to comment on this, because I'm going to ask you... You're on newspaper accounts. I'm not, I'm, I, 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 spoke, I spoke to her British father the other day. I spoke to her father the no, other no, day. No, no, but you're still relying on newspaper accounts. I'm relying on her father. Yeah, the, the, Paul the, European Court, the European Court of Human uh, Rights also said that the holding of DNA but that's from good. people who've that's not good. been charged... Of but course it is. We uh, can win. I ask you about Article 8? We only lose one in a thousand. Can I ask you about Article 8? Well, one in a hundred. This Iraqi asylum, se this Iraqi asylum what, seeker was... Can we deal with what we're doing can in I the Can I ask you about Article 8? Yes. Can I ask you about Article 8? This uh, Article yes. 8 of what? The right to family life. This Iraqi asylum seeker was allowed to stay in this country, and he was a failed asylum seeker because of Article 8, because he had a right to a family life. What Paul, Amy's father, says is, what about his right to a family life? Now he's lost his only daughter. Well, I, it sounds like a tragic case, but really it is completely silly to, to reduce such a tragedy for the family and everybody else to this absurd exchange. A minister like myself can't keep up a running commentary on every decision of every court reacting to newspaper descriptions of the facts mm. or the reaction of aggrieved relatives or victims or whoever. Mm. So, so, Paul, what do you think? I think, he's, I think the fact that he never answered the question sort of speaks volumes there. Uh, um, he, he knows there's a problem with Article 8, and, uh, and clearly the conference uh, this week isn't going to address that problem. Um, you know, this, this is the whole point, you know, this is how politicians dance around the subject and they talk a lot of hot air, but to actually get any, any tangible sort of, you know, real decisions to be made, it just, it just doesn't seem to happen. And um, I'm a bit disappointed, really. I would have liked to listen to what Mr. Kenneth Clark had to say because he's fully aware of my case. They all are. Um, and the fact that he never answered the question sort of speaks volumes. It sort of says that I'm right. Well, Roger Helmer uh, as well uh, there, and Isabella Sankey from Liberty. Hello, Isabella. Hi there. Good morning. Roger Helmer, Conservative MEP, defector of the UK Independence Party. Helmer, do we need to get, get out of this legislation? Uh, we absolutely do. Uh, the, the, the whole series of examples of just outrageous and perverse decisions, and the public out there are angry about it. I'm just astonished to hear Ken Clark saying, in effect, look, don't trouble me with the facts. I'm a minister. I can't be bothered with the facts. I can't be bothered with public opinion. Uh, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. It's just not good enough. But he's right. he's right about the positives. He's right about the fact that the DNA database, innocent people's DNA cannot be kept. He's right about the fact that we're a leading example of uh, a beacon for gay rights in the world. He's right about all the positives. You never talk about the positives, do you? Well, we in Britain can make the right decisions for our country. What we've done is we have outsourced a whole range of decisions to foreign, well, I wouldn't call them judges. Most of them have very little legal experience. It's a political court, not, uh, not a, 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 a court where justice is dispensed. Um, we have a long history and a very proud history uh, of our legal system and our human rights in the UK, uh, and a coach and horses is being driven through that, and a whole series of Perverse decisions is coming out. Well, no, okay, tell us about another. Is Isabella, I'll bring you in, in in a second here. I'm sure you're dying to grab this one. Tell us about another perverse decision. Of course they happen, and what happened to Paul and Amy? Uh, and to Amy and Paul, it's absolutely tragic. Well, it's we've awful. We've had a whole succession of these issues of family life. Let's have another now, one. I Give us another one. Well, I'm sorry, I don't have a list here for you. Um, you know, it is not my job to make a list. It is my job to be aware of the uh, uh, of the situation. And frankly, you can open the newspaper every day, and you can do that as well as I can. Again and again. Can we probably, have people. You can well, we have Abu Qatar, and we have all these people. Isabella. If you, open the, if you rely on the newspapers to get accurate reporting on this, then, then you're barking up the wrong tree because the newspapers frequently misrepresent and distort these cases because certain sections of the press have a vested interest in us scrapping the Human Rights Act and pulling out of the European Convention because the, the Article 8 right to private and family life um, holds them to account for some of their more lurid kiss-and-tell stories. Well, that, yes, so that's, that's true, but Isabella, clear. important to say that we're not relying on press reports, we're relying on the dad of Amy here, Paul Houston, which is quite and, different. 
different. And, and, and if I may, if I may, I have enormous sympathy with, with Mr. Houston. I've met him and I've talked to him about his case and it's um, an incredibly, incredibly tragic case, what, what happened to his daughter. But the Human Rights Act is not um, the, 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 the piece of legislation or, or, or the thing to blame in his case. The actual reason why um, the, um, Mr. Ibrahim couldn't be deported um, is because the Home Office didn't act quick enough to seek his deportation after he was convicted in, in, in the way that he was. Again, it was another incident to the Home Office blunder. Um, and the judge in the case actually said if the Home Office had sought his deportation at an earlier point, there would have been nothing here to, to, to keep him in the UK. But the fact was, by the time they sought his deportation, he had had two children in the UK and he'd um, uh, taken over the adoption of, of two more. And what the court was interested in was the rights of his innocent children not to have their fa father sent away. Of course, there's difficult balancing um, judgments that have to be taken in these cases, but it was actually Home Office inefficiency um, which is to blame here. But of course, All right, so as we've seen many so times... Paul, let's let Paul back in here. The rights, the rights, the rights, Paul, do you want to come back in? The rights yes, of Mr Ibrahim's uh, innocent well, children. Let, let, me, let me tell you how the, the, the facts are, because I, I was at the tribunal. I was at every tribunal Mr Ibrahim attended. Uh, yeah, there is, there is some truth regarding... It's a bit of both, you know, you have to understand. I mean, Isabella is right in the sense that, that you know, the border agency is ineffective and, and had they dealt with the case sooner, then it, and with a lot of cases, it wouldn't get to the human rights stage. Um, but, I mean, I, I accept what you said. It's the right of, of, of Mr. Ibrahim's children, um, uh, their human rights. But it still doesn't address the imbalance of where does it say that Mr. Ibrahim's children come before the rights of, of my child and, and my human rights. And the thing was, is in the actual court, uh, it wasn't proved. Well, first of all, uh, I'm not so sure about that he's actually adopted the, the two other children that Miss Richardson has, um, because I don't see how he could be if, if, he's, if he hasn't got legal status in the country. Is this about, then, I I Isabella Sankey, is this about the Act itself, or is it about the interpretation of the Act by lawyers in this country and judges in this country? Look, not, uh, I think it's fair to say that not everybody is going to agree about how these principles and values in, are interpreted in, in, in each case. The point about this case I was making was that there, it's very easy for the Human Rights Act to be a scapegoat for blundering officials, and we see that all the time. And I think it's very important to make this, to make this distinction. But of course there are going to be disagreements. Of course the Act um, has to deal with... Uh, of course judges applying the Act have to deal with very sensitive uh, balancing of, of judgments. But the problem we have in this country at the moment is whenever there is a decision that certain people don't like or senior politicians feel annoyed about. Instead of just expressing disquiet about that, people start talking about revisiting these fundamental values yeah. we've believed in as a society for a long time. You know, in the US, when, they, when there's a controversial decision under the US Bill of Rights, people don't talk about ripping it up and starting again. Um, you know, the, the, the convention was put into place by um, Winston Churchill following the horrors of the Second World War, and it was meant, it was put there to protect every single man, woman and child okay, I'm going to ask in you this a, country. I'm going to ask you in a moment, I'll stay there please, I'm going to ask you in a moment or two the, uh, Isabella after the travel news to, to make the case to the British people for the European Court of Human Rights, to tell us what I suppose classically Monty Python star, what's the European Court of Human Rights ever done for us? So prepare that one Isabella, and I know you'll do a, you'll do a good turn on it. Let's get quick, quick comments, they're very quick comments from everybody, and I'm, I'm going to rush through this if you'll, if you'll uh, let me. Michael in Worcestershire, a quick comment from you sir, good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. A quick comment. Well, I've, I'm very strongly against the human rights because it was originally drawn up for lesser nations after the Second World War. I can remember uh, Churchill saying it was for lesser nations. It was not for Britain. And we drew this stupid act up. Not stupid, no, because it, was, it, had, a, it had a rightful place at, at the time. OK, thank you, Michael. Peter in Durham, quick comment. I think we should keep the Court of Human Rights. Uh, the human rights legislation protects minority groups, of which I happen to be one. And in this country, we have a Public Order Act, which has a Section 5 in it, which actually allows prejudice and uh, allows prosecution for people with prejudice um, against others who have done absolutely nothing wrong. The only defence that we have under British law is the Court of Human Rights. Thank you, Peter. Tony and Macclesfield, your quick well, comment. I think we're perfectly competent to judge our own people under our own laws, and we have done for centuries. I see no need for an external body to override or uh, act in judgment on what we can do. Thank you. John in Dumbarton, finally, before the travel news. Hi, John. 
Well, if you were a gay person before the year 2000, the British courts and the British Parliament were totally useless to failed gay people. If it hadn't been for the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, gay people would be getting chucked out of the armed forces today in 2012. And lots of pensioners now get the prescriptions at 60. Before it used to be 65 for men and 60 for women. They had to go all the way to Strasbourg. So a lot of your elderly callers are anti-European. You remember, they get their free prescriptions at 60 thanks to the European Court decision in Strasbourg. Thank you very much indeed. Right, Isabella Sankey is going to make the case in a minute. I'm sure Roger Helmer won't uh, particularly agree with uh, I think Paul's going to be still with us, uh, talking, uh, arguing his case from the standpoint of the tragic death of Amy. It's 9.20. Here's me. It's 9.22. Right, Isabella Sankey. Are you ready? Director of Policy at Human Rights Group Liberty, you made a very interesting point earlier on. There is a, a distinct lobby in this country who are against it because they're worried about freedom of expression in the press being in some way restricted. So you argue that that gives a disproportionately negative view of the European Court of Human Rights. Balance it up for us. Go on. Well, there's lots of things you don't read about in the headlines that the European Court has done to protect people in this country and, in fact, all over Europe for many, many decades. We wouldn't have the equal treatment provisions that we now have in our law for um, the protection of, 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 um, of lesbian and gay people if it weren't for judgments from the European Court of Human Rights, which insists that you cannot be discriminated against on the grounds of your race, your sex, or, or, or your sexual orientation. Did you know, for example, as well, that if it weren't for the European Court of Human Rights, we wouldn't have phone hacking offences on the statute book, which means that everything that went on at News of the World and elsewhere wouldn't actually be illegal if it weren't the previous judgments that we got in the 1990s. How do we know we wouldn't? How do, you, how do we know that we wouldn't have made that illegal anyway and have, have, have altered our own laws accordingly, as we, as we have done over the centuries? Well, if you look at the way in which we've altered our laws over the last few decades, it's invariably only in response to the European Court of Human Rights judgments when oh, the government's nonsense. hand has been forced um, that they've brought our, our laws into line with, um, with, 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 with human rights standards. That's why it's so important that there's an independent check on government to protect each and every man, woman and child in this country. And, and the list goes on. And the former, the, Archbishop, is, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, before you talk about the irony, because the, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Carey, is uh, one of a group of people... Uh, a, a certain hue of Christian who are taking, their, uh, hoping to take their, co their case to the European Court of Human Rights uh, uh, to, to uh, bolster their arguments that they should be able to display their religious symbols, aren't they? Yes, and actually Liberty used to um, represent Nadia Awaita, the, the, the woman who uh, worked for British Airways that just wanted to wear um, a, a cross around her neck and, and was told that she couldn't. This is the point. It's not just uh, minority groups or unpopular groups that the court protects and the convention protects. It's actually the only, um, uh, the only way in which um, any right to religious freedom can be defended in the courts, and that's why they're having to rely on Article 9 to go to the European Court to say that Christian people in this country should be allowed to manifest their, their their faith um, in, in a reasonable way. So it protects everybody in all sorts of ways. Um, but even people don't we don't like. Mm. Even people we don't like who deserve protection as well. And that is the marker, surely, of a civilised society. Roger you can't Helmer. talk up human yeah, rights I mean, in there, Burma there's, there's so and denigrate them at home. Being talked. I mean, lots and lots of these things that come from Europe. People talk about Europe's given us clean beaches, as though we wouldn't have legislated for clean beaches by ourselves. Now, the point is that the European Court of Human Rights is preventing us from dealing with terrorists, uh, leaving them on the streets, preventing us from sending them back home. It's preventing us from ejecting uh, illegal immigrants who have committed serious crimes. And the public just can't understand that. And let's look at this um, issue of a right to a family life. Of course, people have a right to a family life. But why do they have a right to a family life in Britain, uh, if they are being ejected, they can take their family with them and they can have a family life in their own country. What right do they have to come here and commit crimes here and stay here and claim welfare here? You know, the public are angry about this and they want to see it changed, and I hope it will be changed. Isabella? Oh, sorry. I was going right. to come back at that I, one. I, hadn't, well, I, it was quite, I thought it was quite... quite uh, Vibrant stuff from Roger. I'm sure you didn't doze off. Look, 
<laughs> Look, there's nothing in there's nothing in the convention that stops us from prosecuting people um, that, that that we suspect of, 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 of terrorism, and that's what's so bonkers about. Oh, the there is. We now, now find that's, ourselves. that's just a, just a downright untruth. We're, we're we're finding that this doesn't happen, there's but we can't put not. them away. We can't. Of course, put them... you can prosecute somebody who you suspect of terror offences. We've always been able to do that. But frequently, in, in the country. case of terrorist offences, it isn't possible to use the evidence which is available to the authorities for reasons that you know perfectly that's... well. That's absolutely not true. Mr. Gattada's place, there's evidence all over the place of him inciting, um, inciting people to do violent acts, and we could quite easily put him on trial. The problem is the previous government adopted this approach of all we need to do in these cases is deport people. What if he was a British national? What would we do with him then? I would hope we would prosecute him. So, so um, you're and, saying and, that and, there and, should and, be no difference between British nationals and foreign criminals? But, but, no, but, there, there, is the, there is the possibility of deporting people. There always has been. The only bar well, there isn't, of because we're prevented is from doing so by the if you think rights. that somebody is going to be tortured or they're going to face torture evidence in their trial. And if we are a civilised society and if we believe in fundamental rights and freedoms and if we want to stand in solidarity with people currently spilling blood on the streets of Syria, mm. then we have to um, abide by these principles at home and not be hypocrites. Well, to, to curtail our own human rights would be a terrible example, wouldn't it? There's Stephen in Surrey and Jimmy in Durham. Let's see what the public thinks. Stephen, a quick word. Yes, uh, um, it makes me sick when I hear Liberty whining on. We have people like Shami Chakrabarti, the director, coming on. Uh, we've got another woman on today. They talk about vested interests. What about the vested interests of these human rights lawyers milking the taxpayer? I'm sick of the Human Rights Act. You know, it's, it's, it's an absolute disgrace. We had the old Matrix change that we show you, Bufku, see, that got the Afghan hijackers off with human rights legislation. They make me want to vomit. They really do. The sooner we pull out of this, this damn convention, which initially was a good idea uh, after, after the Holocaust, but it's, be it's now becoming a charter for terrorists and undesirables. That's and I I'm disgusted when I heard Ken Clark this morning. Absolutely disgusted. And the sooner we're out of this human rights industry, the better. What, what about the... Are the, the, are the OK, let's Stephen in Surrey. Uh, Jimmy and Durham, come back to Stephen on that. You, you think the opposite. Good morning. Well, I used to come from that, uh, from that angle. I, I didn't like what was going on, but... Um, on my case, it's only a simple thing, but overall it's a big thing in a way. I'm a self-employed every goods vehicle driver. Yeah. And uh, the European Commission, who will be even like Nazi Germany, have rammed a, a law through where I have to ob obey the working time directive. Now, that's only a small thing. And I got to think to myself, what else could come after that? So you need somebody to keep that lot in... Co in uh, keep, keep them... You know, so that they can't run rough road like the presently are doing. So that you was a, that, that was that, that was was that the European, European commissioning? Was that the European Court of Human Rights? Was it? So yeah. No, no, that that, that wasn't them. But you would need them in future yeah, when right. the European Commission and people like uh, Mr. Stephen Hughes and a UOMP who uh, who run things through against a lot of people's wills. <laughs> well, if, you if know, I, you need it, an it, outside body to stop them okay, running rough road. That, that, hang on a minute, well, and that, Stephen as well. A, a very good thing. Stephen as well. What about uh, and indeed your your good self, uh, Roger Helmer? Stephen, and sorry. Yeah. The UK DNA database on the fourth of December two thousand and eight, European Court of Human Rights gave its judgment uh, relating to that, uh, stating that the retention of cellular samples, fingerprints, and DNA profiles constitutes an infringement of the right for private life but under me, Article we, Eight. We, we could have a the British Bill of Rights. We could have a British Bill of Rights. That, 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 that protects our okay. interests. Why can't we have a British Bill of, Bill of Rights, uh, Isabella do you know, Sankey? Do you know what, the, the nonsense of the position that we should have a British Bill of Rights and that would give oh, us more privacy is... If we, if we, we had, if there was a British Bill of Rights, it would put human rights lawyers like her out of business, give wouldn't give it? Her, give, it? Her, give her the right to talk. Let me just explain to you, you would actually be the reverse of what you're trying to do. Give her the right to explain. Give her the right. You would the of what you're trying to do. The point about the Human Rights Act is it actually allowed British judges for the first time to adjudicate on the European Convention, which means we're sending less cases to Strasbourg now and having less judgments from European Fewer. judges. So if you're against European judges ruling on what this country does, then you should be in favour of the Human Rights Act. And, 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 if, and if you scrapped the Human Rights Act and had a British Bill of Rights, it would mean all those cases were going back off to Strasbourg well, again. Well, so it would be well, a real why would it? You wouldn't go to Strasbourg at all if it we had a British Bill of Rights. It would be own goal to scrap the Human Rights well, Act and replace it with but the we, British we Bill of Rights. But we can't let that one go. That's absolute nonsense. The whole point of bringing it back to the UK is that nothing would then go to Strasbourg. So to say that a British Bill of Rights... It was, uh, it was bill never rights... the case that nothing was going to Strasbourg. I'm so sorry, but you really are misunderstanding the legislation. It was never the case that nothing would go, but the point is that more cases are now adjudicated on here and don't have to go all the no, way to Strasbourg. No, you're mixing up two entirely
entirely different things. You're mixing up the, the British implementation of the European Convention on the one hand with the idea of a British Bill of Rights on the other. If we had a British Bill of Rights, we would be saying we are using the British Bill of Rights in place of the, the, the previous European Convention of Human Rights, and, what we and that would be adjudicated in British Human Rights Act, which domestically incorporates the Convention. So people would argue, trust me, I'm a, uh, I'm a human rights lawyer, I know what the arguments would be. People would argue... Well, trust me, I'm a politician, I know what the law would be. Trust me, I'm a politician. They would, go, they would go off to Strasbourg and argue that the British Bill of Rights didn't properly protect their rights, but the Europe, European Convention did. At the moment, they but can't But we would withdraw because... from the European Convention if we had a British Bill of Rights. And what kind of message would that send to every despot yeah, what, dictator but, uh, around the world? What would be the point of creating a British Bill of Rights if we were also subject separately to the jurisdiction of another court? You just have duplicated the system and made matters worse. Well, those advocating a British Bill of Rights in government are not advocating pulling out of the convention. They think that they can maintain both positions, and there is a, there is a complete contradiction and, 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 and an irony well, there. Well, well, my position would be we don't need a British Bill of Rights. We can depend on British common law and a free press and democracy, and we don't need the European Convention. I think the European Convention, when it was introduced, was an excellent thing, but it's been over-interpreted and over-interpreted for decades by activist judges who have entirely the their own agenda, and it's not an agenda the British people share, and there is no democratic accountability to it. Thank well, you. And we should be out of it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, 9.32, and here is Simon. Thank you. 9.34. Paul, um, thank you for talking to us this morning. You're welcome. Paul Houston, uh, where, do you, where do you take your campaign now, Justice for Amy? Well, uh, you know, I'll just keep chipping away and making my viewpoint made, uh, you know, and, and just, because and, I believe I'm right. You know, the thing is, is the way, the way, the the general public feel we're starting to feel alienated by the, the Human Rights Act. I mean, it's a hypocrisy. The Human Rights Act, where the Human Rights Act was set up to protect the, the people from the state, and that's a perfect example in Syria. But the way the general public now see it is, we see it's, it's about protecting the rights of paedophiles and criminals and, and terrorists. And um, you know, why should we concern ourselves too much about somebody that wants to kill us when we see the genuine people of Syria suffering? So, and I feel that the uh, okay. the Brighton Declaration, I don't really think that that really is, is the answer because we were promised reform of the Human Rights Act, um, and what what we're actually going to get is looking at it is, is it's more about compliance of individual states so it's about more about the states towing the line so it doesn't really address the original question of of whether the, the european court has too much power and okay. if, you know before we can sell the human rights to the rest of the world we have to make us the, the general public believe in it and i don't think it's got the backing of the general public thank you and it, you're welcome we're gonna have to leave it there paul we're way over time but good to have you on the program it's nine thirty-six. should britain pull out of the european court of human rights let's talk to Martin Howe, who is a human rights lawyer. Hello, Martin. Good morning. Human rights lawyers were getting a pretty bum rap from a previous caller a few minutes ago. I don't know if you heard him say, so, oh... I didn't hear it, but yeah, human rights lawyers in a state agency, yes, we're in the same <laughs> Also, uh, we have Peter Bone, Conservative MP for Welling Borough. Hello. Uh, who's been uh, pressing for Abu Qatada's deportation. Good morning, Peter Bone. Good morning. And Mark's in Staffordshire. Mark, what would you like to say? Well, Nicky, I, I, I think there's, I'm, I'm going to sit between uh, your uh, MP and uh, uh, Liberty here and um, bang really the pair together in as much as what they need to understand is the Co European Court of Human Rights does do lots of great things. Um, it, it doesn't just deal with, uh, you know, gay rights, which people keep going on about, which I've got no issues with at all. It does lots of other good things. However... It does need reforming. It needs bringing up to date. And the only way that that's going to happen in a positive way is liberty uh, working alongside government and other pressure groups should work together and find positive ways to make the, the uh, uh, European Court of Human Rights work. They also need to stop, um, you know, harking on about um, the, the rights of um, the particular case at the moment with regard to his children. You know, for goodness sake, if, if there was care about his children, why has this taken 10 years to be resolved? Why hasn't the Court of Human Rights stopped and thought about the rights of those children involved in this case yeah. and, and just get things knuckled down and sorted out? What about As prisoner a, giving prisoners the vote, that other one? I, I, I personally am uh, against the idea of giving prisoners the vote. I think uh, if you commit a crime and you go to prison, 
uh, your rights should be uh, reduced. And I think any sound, normal human being would think of that way as, as well. Lawyers, uh, which I spend an awful lot of money with and, and I have a lot of respect for, with due respect, uh, do earn an awful lot of money out of the, the uh, whole process where, you know, if, if, if they were a loan company, they would be severely pulled in check. Oh, well, there you go you again. Know. Let's bring him in. Let's bring him in again. Martin, Martin, how, why have human rights lawyers? I mean, for goodness sake, you know, the, you know, the nastiest, most evil criminal who's done the most horrible thing still has human rights, doesn't he? Absolutely. And uh, you, you must always put yourself or your family in that position. If someone is coming at you unfairly, or if they're not taking into account your fundamental rights, would you want them protected? And would you go to a human rights lawyer um, for, for that protection? I mean, uh, to, to, just to come back on your, your, com your, your contribution there from, from the caller about human rights, law rights lawyers somehow being the, uh, the Rolls Royce rich lawyers mm. of the law, uh, you're quite the opposite, it's true. I mean, le legal aid is the um, and, and under legal aid is, is, is the sort of the payment system if you can get it it's being taken away by our present government. So how does it need to change the European Court of Human Rights? What's wrong with it? It, it, it needs changes in its procedure and administration. And where you have a situation with a 150,000 backlog of cases and the delay that naturally comes with that, that's you know, there's something very wrong with that. But let's remember that there are already steps in place to improve that. I mean, now we have manifestly inadmissible cases. That's the test uh, being looked at by single judges within the European Court. And the estimate is that by 2015, the backlog will be cleared. So I, I'm in favour of, of those types of administrative improvements. I am massively in favour of any encouragement that comes out of the uh, convention currently in Brighton that will improve the domestic application of the European Convention on Human Rights across the 47 states. What has been achieved through the European Court of Human Rights that would not and could not have been achieved through a purely British legal system? Well, what we do have is a uniformity of approach across 800 million people. And there's massive benefit from that. You know, let's remember that human rights have a universality. Well, they do, but, but the Russians, for example, are not very pleased about having lesbian and gay rights foisted on them. Uh, well, and, 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 and there, there, is the, there, there is the real rub in this. If, if we say we're pulling out of the European Convention... Uh, and, and remember, we were the founding fathers of it. I mean, w w with Churchill would be spinning in his grave if he thought we were pulling out of a, a convention and a court that he was very much behind setting up. So uh, it, countries like Russia would look to countries like us and say, well, look, if they're not prepared to be supervised by this court, if they're not prepared to come under its jurisdiction... Why should we? And, and similarly, uh, you know, regimes around the world, Assad's regime in Syria. If, if, we, if we try to hold them to account for breaches of human rights, but we turn around and say, but on the other hand, we're not going to be looked at. You can't look at us. Don't look, on, look, don't look in, in, into our affairs. What type of message does that give? OK. Uh, Peter Bowen. Well, I suppose I disagree with most of what's just been said. That's why you're on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I think that... Uh, the sovereign countries such as the United Kingdom uh, should make its own decisions and our Supreme Court has said deport Mr. Katada and he should go. And I think a court that has 150,000 cases backlog is a farce. And uh, in ev I, I, I can see no point in, 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 in the court whatsoever. But um, in the case of uh, this alleged terrorist, I just put him on the plane, send him home and worry about the legal situation afterwards. Because if we don't do that, we'll be talking about this case in five years' time because his lawyers will have found every, at every stage an additional way of appealing against the, the court decision. I wonder what Martin Swindon thinks. Hello, Matt. Morning, Nick. Um, the thing that's got my goat this morning is, is the, the lady from Liberty trying to draw comparisons between campaigning for, for a, a lady who works for an airline, wanting to wear a cross, and then campaigning on behalf of this, this chap who's, um, you know, tragically killed this young, young girl. Mm. Um, as as the, the father rightly pointed out, where's his right to a family life? I, I just find the whole thing completely bizarre. Uh, and really do think that we, we as a country need to address our role within the, the European um, 
issue of human rights. Thank you very I much think indeed. It was about time we, we pulled out of it. And, okay. Uh, you know, but what sort of message would that send if we if we pulled out of the of this? What what message would it send uh, to the rest of the world, Martin Howe? Those countries that we're trying to encourage to, in, in, in you know, put well, human rights be, on their statutes. Yeah, it has to be a negative message. If we say that we we, we are. We're not going to be accountable. We're not going to be held up to account by a higher court. And, and I think back to the words of Thomas Fuller, who wrote back in 1733, be thou ever so high, the law is above you. If we challenge the rule of law, the message to other countries is, well, if, if, if they're not going to bother abiding by it, why should we? That's the danger, Peter Doan, isn't it? Peter Bone. Uh, well, no, I just, I, I just take this... Um this idea that somehow you know better than another country is to be uh, pretty un uh, un unimpressive. Um, a sovereign country should make its own laws, make its own um, courts I interpret them. I don't see why we should have a European super court. I just don't think that sovereign nations should should be put in that position and i just think the idea that churchill will be spinning in his grave well that might be true but he would be spinning his grave because the the, the the conventions have been turned completely around it was there to protect people against fascists it's now being used to protect ter alleged terrorists and that points tony in wakefield makes that point i think just before the travel news I, I think he's echoing what you were about to say as i understand it tony yeah that's right i mean the the, the european uh, convention on human rights was drafted largely in the, uh, well, just after the war in the late 40s, and it was a completely different world. And, you know, there's no way that the original draftsman believed that Abu Qatar would be walking around the streets of London and we couldn't deport him, because the fact is, in 1947, he would have been hanging on the end of a rope long ago. The debate That's seems to be right. the debate seems to be hanging on what what well, would be, be what would be making be. Uh, would Winston be. Churchill be. spin in his grave. Yeah. I'm saying it's a completely different world, Nicky. I mean, it is. You know, he, they, they, the way they thought at that time, they, you know, Abu Qatar couldn't really have done what it was happened. Really, it couldn't have happened. You know. Thank you very much so, indeed. It's nine forty nine. Here's Michelle. Your call. Hello, Frank in Taunton. Good morning. On you go. Good morning, Nikki. Yeah, I'd just like to make a brief point about the relevance uh, of uh, Article 8, right to private and family life. The conversations and discussions centred around uh, terrorists, etc., which has very little relevance, thankfully, to most individuals listening to your programme. But as one of millions of uh, fathers who've gone to the courts to seek access and gain access to their children, uh, I was told repeatedly, 33 dates in court, that Article 8, the right to private and family life, meant absolutely nothing to me. And there'll be people turning up in court today that that's relevant to. So whilst it's a fantastic talk show, the relevance of Article 8 to the common man and woman in the street uh, is limited. And I think that's uh, a great, uh, of great relevance. It is, and let's, let's, put that, terrorists. let's put that to uh, Dominic Rubb, who joins us, Conservative MP, member of the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Human Rights. Is, is sceptic, I think we sh can fairly say, about the European Court for Human Rights. Did you hear that point there by Frank? I did. Yeah, what do you make of it? Good point, well made. Mm. The application of these... It seemed they, the, the, some people see this as selective application. Dominic well, I thought uh, there's a number of myths running around. The first is that this is Ch Churchill's convention, and the, the NGOs love to criticise the tabloid media, but the fact is they deploy so much spin of their own. This convention was signed up to by the Attlee government in the late 40s, but even then, we didn't sign up to the jurisdiction of the Strasbourg court till 1966 under Harold Wilson. What any of this has got to do with Churchill is beyond me, although he certainly did favour more European integration for continental Europeans. In terms of the selectivity, um, your previous human rights lawyer, I think Martin Howe, Hmm. said that there that we've got to be in favour of uniform approaches to human rights across Europe. And yet, if you're Michael Turner or Andrew Sameo, extradited, innocent until proven guilty, but nonetheless extradite, extradited to appalling prison conditions, who m people that are innocent, you look at that and then you look at someone like Qatar and Hamza running our, our justice system, running rings around our justice system, and you say, actually, but Hamza's being uniform, there are double standards. Hamza's being extradited. Say again? Hamza is being extradited. Yeah, after years and years, and Qatar hasn't been. The point I'm making is that if you're on subject to a European arrest warrant, your feet don't touch the ground. Whereas actually you can, and, and in the case of Qatar, um, you know, at the moment we're still battling against this Strasbourg ruling. The point I'm making is that there is, there is double standards here. Okay, Martin Howe, double standards. I mean, it's difficult to 
comment on specific cases without having access to all the facts. And I, and I, and I think your listeners should be aware of that. Uh, what there is, there is a well-established jurisprudence in Europe that is applied consistently and uniformly across the 47 states, the 800 million people that are in it. And it's that type of universality of the application of fundamental rights that's at the heart of this. This is a myth. When we start tinkering with it, as, as Dominic Rabb has suggested, when we start pulling ourselves out of it, then we do create this confusion is a and... Gentlemen. Wrong decision. Gentlemen, we have the latest developments. I'll get you both to comment on this. The government uh, says that the European Court of Human Rights should dismiss Abu Qatada's appeal against deportation to Jordan because he has missed the deadline. Uh, we know about that. Let's uh, get the very latest from our legal um, correspondent, Clive Coleman. Clive, what is the new information that you have? Yeah, well, um, I've just spoken to a senior human rights lawyer who has uh, a wealth of experience at the European Court of Human Rights on the crucial point of when time begins to run on this time limit. Uh, and uh, it's a real lawyer's point, but a um, pretty clear one in his view, that uh, if you look at Article 43, what it says is, within a period of three months from, and from is the critical word, the date of the, judge, of, the, of the judgment of the chamber. Now, the chamber judgment was the first judgment in the Abu Qatada case, uh, given on the 17th of January of this year. Three months from that date uh, expires at midnight on the 17th of April. So that would mean that on that wording, on that interpretation, the government got it wrong. Now, in support of that... Uh, he says that there's another uh, time limit. It's not the same time limit, but the time limit for bringing cases, applications to the European Court of Human Rights, also has a six-month time limit. And that uh, the same principles, he thinks, apply. And again, the wording of that article says, within a period of six months from the date on which the final decision was taken. That's, well, in that instance, will be the final decision of a domestic court. So in both cases, the time limit is worded in terms of from the date of the last judgment. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in relation to that, there was a case that, uh, called Otto versus Germany, where the European Court of Human Rights uh, ruled that time runs on that six-month time limit from the day after the date of the final domestic decision. Now, that would take it uh, even later. So is Theresa May up the creek without a paddle? Well, you know, on that analysis, uh, the government has got it wrong. Right, Dominic Rabb. Well, frankly, I, I don't know what the point is here. You found an anonymous human rights lawyer to disagree <laughs> with the government's legal advice. The thing to note about this is that the government... Well, he, Clive was making a point. It seems, Clive, you're saying it's pretty clear, is it? Well, it's not yeah. just... Well, it's an, uh, an anonymous human rights lawyer. It's a human rights lawyer who's looking at the wording that sets down right. when these applications have to... No, no, uh, sure, uh, but that's the, exactly the what the Home Secretary said that she and countless lawyers have done and then called up the European Court of Human Rights and said, have we got this right? And then and they said, proceeded. Yeah. And, yeah, and they were reassured they did. I, I, I personally think this appeal will be dismissed. Um, uh, but I think there's a bigger question about what happens when the revived deportation process goes through the UK courts. And as I expect, it is given a, a green light. And then we will have a political choice to make. But um, I don't, you know, I, I, it would be inconceivable to my mind that the Home Office, which does so many of these cases, um, would have made if a mistake. If she's got it wrong, regard. What, where does that leave for if? She has got it wrong. Uh, look, I'm not going to speculate Go on, uh. on if, ifs and buts, but, I, but I'm pretty confident, and I think she seems very confident that they've got this right, and, uh, you know, the Home Office lawyers are pretty, are pretty well-versed in all of this. Uh, Martin Howe? Is it wrong? Sorry? Um, you know, the, the idea that, that it's inconceivable that government makes wrong decisions is inconceivable in itself. Um, and, and I think we should be looking at substance, not form here. Are we really saying that this man's rights about, about an, an issue as important as torture should all turn on about, a 22-hour... It's not time. about him being tortured. Is it? No, exactly. It, it's not about him being tortured. It's, it's not a torture well, it, case well, really it, at all. It, it, well, it, it is really here, because the, the, the judgment that has... or the part of the judgment that has been appealed by his lawyers was the finding made on the 17th of January of this year that he would not face torture when he went back. The reason that he wasn't to be deported according to the European Court was because the evidence that would be placed against him, that was obtained by use of torture. Allegedly. So, so, so they're, appealing the, the, they're appealing the point that there is no, what's called an Article 3 risk. There is no risk of him being tortured on return. But we've had assurances for the Jordanian government. Who are we to lecture to other governments? 
Well, I mean, do we believe in a rule of law or not? Well, human rights law is very often the first people who say we should... Can I, can I just Dominic make a very right, simple yeah. point? The, the, the issue about whether Qatar will be tortured if he was sent back to Jordan had three appeals in this country and then went to Strasbourg. Everyone has said no. The issue is whether we can guarantee, Britain can guarantee, he'd have a fair trial. We talk about the rule of law a lot. I think, frankly, Strasbourg is making a mockery of the rule of law and British justice by... Uh, whole, turning human rights into a dirty word because we're allowing someone like this who's a, a, um, a, um, accused of serious terrorist offences has a long history of involvement in terrorism run rings around our justice system no one is suggesting he shouldn't have due process but he's had four appeals already including one at Strasbourg how many more until the human rights lawyer says actually do you know what he did have due process well, he has as many as, as, as he is allowed under due process. And that's the point. We think that he's had three UK appeals, he's now been to Strasbourg, had the case properly heard... But you know what? ...and he wants to appeal again. A final thought, Dominic Rabb. Yeah. Abu Qatar is the sort of person who doesn't want anyone to have any of these rights. Isn't it rather wonderful that we're fighting that he can have the rights that he doesn't want any of us to have? Isn't that just... But isn't that just a great thing? Doesn't that just put us on that... that, that, that high... high pedestal? Nikki, I'll leave you on cloud nine. I think most people <laughs> think it's a, a lack of common sense. Thank you, Dominic Rob. Cheers. Thank you very much indeed to Clive Coleman there for that uh, interesting conversation that he had recently had with a, an, anonymous, an anonymous human rights lawyer. Far from an anonymous one, Martin Howe. Thank you.